I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. This series of podcasts is aimed at financial planning professionals and also those who are looking to enter the financial planning profession. We will be talking during the podcast about all things certified financial planner certification related, talking to other CFPs around the world, and also we will be dropping in on some new entrants who've just entered the financial planning profession, and we'll be checking up along the way on a regular basis with them to see how they're getting on. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. And in today's podcast, we are talking all things assumptions related, a very important topic when building your financial plan for the CFP case study assessment. And I'm joined today by Robert Lockie at Bloomsbury Wealth in London. Welcome, Rob. Hi there. And for those who are very perceptive amongst you, um, you will have noticed that uh, Rob and I have the same surname, don't we? We do indeed. I wonder why that could be. (laughs) Um, And Rob, you were a fellow of the IFP, became a fellow in 1998. Um, By way of background, you've also been the chairman of the Education Committee of the Institute of Financial Planning as well back in early 2000s, I think it was. Um, And also, I think what started uh, your or infamous or famous journey into assumptions, certainly for uh, the first onlookers, um, was the uh, article that you wrote for the Institute of Financial Planning's journal, um, which was all about assumptions and about how to start setting them. And that article proved extremely popular in the CFP fast track courses that the Institute of Financial Planning were running at the time. Um, and you were your your name was kind of up in lights during those courses um, as uh, somebody who really knew their stuff um, about assumptions. And then during that time, you've also been uh, a CFP assessor for the case study assessment of the old level six with the Institute of Financial Planning. And also you contributed to the IFP Fellows Briefing Paper on Assumptions, which was issued around just after 2010, um, not long before the IFP started its merger talks um, with the CISI, which completed in 2015. So you have a bit of history with all things assumptions related, don't you? Uh, it, it seems that I do, yes. Um, <laughs> I think it probably grew out of the... Um, uh, when I was an, when I was an assessor for the for the CFP, um, and um, uh, when uh, and also when I ran um, training courses for it, uh, we always um, spent we always massively overran on the first section about assumptions when I was running the training courses, and when I was assessing, um, it seemed to be the area where people had a significant amount of difficulty and um, and often failed. Um, uh, because their assumptions were a bit um, bit wonky. <laughs> okay, so the aim of the podcast today is to talk about all sorts of wonky assumptions, um, basically to try and help uh, those going through the uh, CISI Level 7 case study assessment en route to becoming a certified financial planner in the UK. Um, and also, we're going to talk a little bit about, towards the end of the podcast, talk about how that rolls out into real life and giving real advice to clients, uh, perhaps using uh, proprietary software or, or spreadsheets. Um, so, let's dive straight in um, and uh, to get get us going, let's talk about why you think we need assumptions when building a financial plan. Uh, well, I'd first of all say that um, if you have a functioning crystal ball, you don't need to make assumptions because you know what the future is going to hold, and um, and therefore the, the the need for assumption disappears entirely. Um, and you may be lucky enough to have one of those, um, but I. Uh, I don't. So um, for me anyway, and and for most of the people I've encountered, um, who most of them are smarter than me anyway, um, they all find that they have to make some sort of assumptions. Uh, and it's, it's very simply because the future is unknown uh, and indeed unknowable. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, we have to make some guesswork to, uh, uh, to, to, 
in order, if we're trying to model anything in, uh, off into the future, we have to we have to guess about um, what um, what we think might happen. Um, and um, uh, I guess assumptions is a um, a slightly more credible sounding word for um, guesswork, um, but it should be uh, there should be some some sound basis behind the assumptions. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, they should be kind of educated guesswork rather than wild guesswork. Yes, absolutely. Educated guesswork. That's just what I was going to say. Um, so um, what sort of what sort of things would we need to make assumptions about? Um, well, broadly speaking, I think um, we would uh, uh, we would sort of want to make assumptions about anything which we don't know uh, and which we need in order to project something into the future. So uh, in the case of a financial plan, um, there is certain information that is knowable. Um, we can know the current values of somebody's assets. We can know the current value of their expenditure. We can know their current income. Um, uh, we can know what their current family situation is. Uh, and there may be some things which they have good reason to expect are going to change. Um, uh, they may be expecting a baby, for example. Um, uh, they may be terminally ill, uh, sort of less, um, uh, less, less um, uh, promising. But um, but equally, that that uh, if that's the case, then there'll be some change happening, and and we can we have a reasonable clue as to when that might be. Um, and um, so that kind of thing that we either know or can predict with some reasonable degree of. Um, of accuracy, we don't need to make assumptions about those. Um, but um, everything else that we we don't know, but we need, but we'll need in our um, in our forward-looking um, uh, plan that runs for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever. Um, we kind of have to make some assumptions there uh, in order to model uh, what the future might look like. And I think it's also important to say to remind people that. We, we aren't just making assumptions for absolutely everything under the sun. Um, we're making assumptions, particularly for the case study assessment, we're making assumptions that are relevant for that client situation, aren't they? So, for example, um, you know, if the client rents a house, we wouldn't make, we wouldn't put in in the plan um, an assumption about house price escalation unless it was relevant for, for something along the way. Well, indeed, yes. Uh, you know, if they're planning to buy a house, then um, uh, they may want to make provision for what that's going to cost, and therefore, um, including the, um, some house price escalation data in the in the in the plan would would be relevant in their case. Um, I guess probably the the ones that that have the biggest or the one that has the biggest impact is undoubtedly the rate at which your expenditure escalates. Um, so it's worth um, spending some time thinking about that. Um, because over a long period of time, the rate at which you're um, you're pulling money out of your plan uh, is going to have a massive impact on the uh, on, on the end result. Um, yeah. But there's also the rate at which you expect your earned income to increase. Um, it might be um, that you expect it to go up broadly with price inflation, or you might expect a higher rate, um, uh, or you might expect if you're in a um, uh, if you're in a career path um, where the the likelihood is that there'll be some substantial increases over time, um, you know, if you're one of the professions, for example, um, then you might you might want to assume a higher rate, uh, and then maybe a, a a falling increase rate, a falling rate of increase uh, as as you get um, get more established. Yes, and. That, that reminds me of um, the story that I used to tell people on the training courses about um, my chiropractor and for for if he was in you know he was self-employed he ran his own business he, he hired and employed his own staff uh, he owned the, a huge building um, and was maintaining all of that and everything so for somebody in in that kind of line of work who's kind of in control of their own destiny um, you know he was putting his prices up by you know probably three times the amount of inflation at the time, um, uh, you know, in excess of you know, 10% a year. Um, so I think there are some things, particularly in, in the case study, when, when we're looking at it and actually when we're talking to clients, that they can give us a really good idea, can't they, about, you know, obviously what they're not only 
what their occupations are, um, but also those future potential enhancements? Well, typically, yes. Um, that you know, no one has a better idea of what their earnings potential is likely to be than the, than the person who is actually going through that career yeah. path. I would think. Yeah. Great. So, looking at the particular types of assumptions, um, you know, we we're going to have to build a whole raft of different sorts of assumptions to set out um, in our in our financial plan for for the assessment for the level seven. Um, things like. Um, uh, a CPI inflation is given to the candidates um, at the start, as well as um, investment rates, uh, cash, fixed interest, equities. Um, that's all predetermined. Um, but then there's still a huge range of potential other assumptions that we would need to make. So let's talk about the if there's any, you know, when you're setting assumptions, these extra assumptions that you would need, and actually all of the assumptions in real life when you're planning for a real client, um, is there any relationship between them, or can you can you set each one out separately? Well, I think some. It's reasonable to conclude that some of them are going to be related. Um, the there isn't unsurprisingly a huge amount of research that um, the people seem to have done about assumptions um, per se. But they, but but there is a lot of work that's done on um, the uh, uh, on, on the, the 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 data that we use to, to make make them. So there is, for example, if you do a search on equity risk premium, you will find a huge amount of material, um, and the equity risk premium is basically the return, the extra return that you expect to receive from investing in equities compared to investing in non-risky assets. Um, so if you hold equities for a long enough period, um, you expect, because you're taking that risk, you expect to get a return that's higher than if you hadn't taken that risk. Yeah. Um, and that's the risk premium. So most, um, uh, well, well, pretty well all assets have a risk premium. Um, all assets that you can invest in have a risk premium. Um, uh, and it may be, um, it may be um, stable or it may be um, rather more wobbly, um, and um, uh, it will uh, it typically fluctuates over time. Um, uh, but the longer the data you can look at, um, the uh, the more stable uh, it the the long term average becomes. Okay. Um, but they are they're certainly related to each other because the, um, uh, the by and large you, um, you you would not expect to find a situation. Where over a long period of time, um, interest rates, uh, the return you get from lending money to people, uh, or the return that you pay for borrowing money from people, um, uh, would would be higher than the risk you get from owning a business or a piece of a business uh, and taking all the risk that that business can fail. Um, so you would expect that over a long period, you'd get a higher return from investing in equity than you would from uh, from from borrowing money or from, from yeah. lending money rather, and when we're and when we're setting out assumptions, you know, there there is that interrelationship. You know, when we're setting down the numbers and thinking it through, that inflation uh, thinking in terms of inflation plus something can be quite useful, can't it? You know, when you're setting the different other asset classes and looking perhaps at you know, one of the assumptions you're not given in the case study assessment is one for annuities or, you know, an annuity stream of income in a generic sense. Um, so then the assumptions that that you make um, are all based on inflation plus that, you know, plus extras, aren't they? Yeah, that's certainly the approach that we uh, we have followed for um, a couple of decades. Um, uh, so we start off with what we think inflation is going to be. Um, and how we think that interest rates are going to relate to that. Will they be higher or lower? And if so, by how much? Um, uh, then we, we look at what, uh, what sort of return we think we can expect to get from, um, from bonds. Um, and then we look at what sort of return we think we can get from equities and real estate uh, and, um, and whether we think there'll be any additional premium from investing in uh, riskier things like emerging markets, um, uh, smaller companies, uh, value stocks. Um, and uh, so that enables us to then kind of build up in what we think is a fairly logical way um, to a, a, a series of asset class returns, which um, 
which which gives us a, a basis for then constructing what our sort of composite will be uh, for any given portfolio. Um, and um, uh, you mentioned um, annuity rates. Uh, well, annuity rates are, um, are based on long-term interest rates. So conveniently, if we have made an assumption for interest rates and we're going to use that assumption uh, for over the long term um, of our plan, uh, then we already have a basic um, starting point for calculating an interest rate um, for, or for, for calculating an annuity rate. Uh, obviously, there are various other um, variables which determine the annuity rate, so the age of the person buying it, um, uh, whether there's any guarantees, when there's an escalation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the starting point is is what the long-term interest rate is um, that the uh, the issuer of the annuity is, is using to back it. Um, and um, uh, I think if you... Uh, if you come up with a long-term interest rate of 2% and then you decide that your annuity rate is going to be based on an interest rate of 5%, um, you're probably going to have some explaining to do. Yeah. yeah, It's not reasonable because they're not st- stacking on top of each other, are they? They're, 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 well, they're not consistent. Uh, you no. may be able to come up with a good reason why they should be different, um, but you probably need to come up with a good reason in order to get that one past the assessors. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Um, and talking about reasonable and, and having a good reason, um, part of the assessment standards and actually a good methodology for, for looking at assumptions when in real life when you're planning for real clients is also thinking about how they are reasoned, how you explain them, and also if they are reasonable um, in, in the kind of round when you're looking at them all, isn't it? Yes, I think so. The, the, um, uh, the, the, if you can... If you can reason something um, in a logical way, then there's a pretty good chance, uh, as I was um, uh, as I was told back in the distant past when uh, um, when being trained how to do CFP case study assessments, um, it, it, then it's likely to be reasonable. So, how would you go about setting out um, an explanation to make it reasonable? Uh, well, the, the the starting point that we um, we tend to use is that um, uh, markets are a pretty efficient way of, of setting um, uh, um, the, uh, setting prices for things, and, and prices basically then determine returns. Um, uh, and um, so we we tend to assume that the market is fairly valued at, at every time that, uh, that 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 there is a valuation for it, um, and that 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 interest rates will. Um, will kind of follow the same sort of rule that the um, yeah, it's not uh, it's, it's not difficult to, to conclude that um, uh, uh, or, to, or to, to, if you look at the data you can see that interest rates move um, uh, quite a lot um, and it's quite difficult to predict I think um, well it's not difficult it's difficult to predict accurately um, you could have looked at interest rates twenty years ago and and said well okay that's uh, I think they're pretty stable. I think that's what they'll what they'll be going forward. Um, and indeed, policy has government policy has been based on these kind of things. And mm-hmm. then you look twenty years later, and different things have changed. And I don't think twenty years ago anyone realistically um, predicted that interest rates would be at um, under a quarter of a percent. Yeah. Um, uh, and with all the implications that that has, good and bad. So your assumptions, they have a historic element, don't they? And then they have a future looking element to it. Yeah, we, we, we tend to sort of look at, um, uh, we, we use a, a bit of a mixture of the, of the two, really. Um, so we'll start off our inflation assumption. Um, we, we tend to adopt the approach that the, the Bank of England has the, um, has the levers it can pull to, uh, and it has a target for where inflation uh, where, where uh, it's supposed to be. So we make the assumption that the Bank of England will hit its target in the long term. Um, in the short term, it may not, and indeed frequently it doesn't because this is an imprecise um, kind of business. Um, but uh, we, we, yes, in, in the long term, we, 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 we assume that, that it will hit its target. Um, uh, obviously, in the past, inflation has been much higher than this. Um, uh, you know, in the seventies, it was twenty-five percent and, and upwards, um, uh, but it's also been fairly low for quite a long time. Um, and the difficulty you have um, 
as I've pointed out to many people over the years, um, you can think you're being cautious if you assume a higher rate of inflation. Um, so say you, assume, so you, you, you say, well, the long-term average inflation in the UK, if you go back to 1950 or whatever, uh, the long-term average might be 5%. Uh, I'm you know, picking a figure out of thin air. Yeah. Um, so you assume 5% going forward rather than the current level, which is sort of two, three-ish. Um, uh, then what that's going to mean is that your expenditure is going to be higher than it would be if you assumed a lower rate. And because your expenditure is higher, your assets will show as depleting more quickly. Yeah. And potentially, your in your projection, your... Um, uh, your estate will will deplete more quickly, and therefore you will protect, you run the risk of running out of resources. And what that leads you to do is uh, either spend less uh, or potentially take more risk. So, in the interest of being cautious, um, you either um, potentially uh, have a less good life than you maybe could have, um, or you actually end up, um, while trying to be cautious, becoming. Uh, obliged to take more investment risk, um, so there isn't a, there's no free lunch for these things, and everything is related. So if you um, so it's important, I think, to try to to get a as accurate a number as you can, um, even though we know that it won't be accurate, uh, and the uh, and the way to deal with the inevitable inaccuracies of of these things is continuous review. Yes, uh, which is unsurprisingly. Annually. A Isn't key it? part of the CFP process. Yeah, and you're looking at at least an annual review each year, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I think um, I think an annual review seems kind of fairly fairly sensible. Um, uh, they uh, some some people's affairs don't change all that much over over two or three years, but um, as a as a starting point, I think annual is is as good as any. Yeah. So let's look at the different methods that we could use to create assumptions when we're making financial plans for our clients. There are a number of different approaches that we can use, aren't there? So just run us through broadly um, two or three different types. Um, well, yeah, the, um, uh, the, the, the simplest um, by a considerable margin is um, what we can call um, deterministic or, or linear assumptions. Um, whereby we um, we come up with a, a set of numbers from um, looking at uh, um, our our prediction for whatever our starting point is. So we use our prediction for inflation. Um, uh, only we don't have to predict it. We steal the Bank of England's target, uh, and then we add on risk premia based on uh, generally some historic as, as far back as we can go, some historic data for risk premia for the various asset classes we own. Um, and um, and then we tend to knock a bit off just in the interests of um, uh, caution, I guess. Um, uh, despite what I just said about if you take too much off the assumptions, then it makes it turn. Then you then you you can end up with um, uh, with a, with a uh, um, somebody running out of money on the projections. But we'd rather project somebody running out of money than project them not running out of money, and then they do. Um, so that's that's the simplest one, and you just apply those those rates of return and those um, those inflation measures to all of the variables you have going forwards, and you end up with a nice line um, showing the um, the value of someone's income and expenditure, and another one showing the value of their um, their, their uh, assets uh, over time, and it goes up or it goes down, or more commonly, it does a bit of both. Okay. Um, so that's that's very simple, but um, uh, it has the obvious drawback uh, that uh, the reality is that if you assume a rate of return of X every year, um, you probably won't get that return uh, every year. Uh, and in fact, I have seen research um, that uh, the people have done where they've looked at that over a you know, 30, 40 year period where there is actual data. Um, and the average return of whatever asset class it was they were measuring um, over that uh, over that period, there was no single year in which it actually matched that long term average. Yeah, and bear, that's the data that was producing the long term average. Um, so you know, you assume a return of six percent, um, uh, or, or rather, you you look at you look at historic data which shows a return of six percent average 
um, uh, over, um, over over that period, um, there's a pretty good chance that there will be no single year within it which had a six percent return. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's um, the obvious drawback to um, to using deterministic assumptions um, that they will be wrong. Um, but I think. Uh, certainly in our experience uh, of dealing with clients, um, clients pretty well understand that you're modelling and um, it's uh, it's going to be wrong. Um, if they can't manage to grasp that, then maybe they um, you need to be spending a bit of time um, explaining to them why that is. Um, so that's the simplest method, but obviously it has flaws. Um, and I suppose the other main one that the people use is, or, or, or there's, there's two other main ones which are kind of similar to each other. Um, uh, one is bootstrapping, whereby you take um, a load of historic returns um, on a kind of monthly basis, maybe. Um, and if you look at 30 years, let's say, then you've got um, uh, 360 monthly returns. And Obviously, those 360 monthly returns occurred in a certain order. Yep. Um, although, if you chart them, they will look like the proverbial um, man, drunken man wandering down the street um, because there will be pr very probably very little in the way of obvious pattern to them. Um, so, by bootstrapping, you take each of those 360 months and you kind of if you if you imagine getting a um, 30 360 bits of paper uh, writing. A, the return of um, one month on each one of them, chucking them all into a box uh, and then pulling them out one at a time and putting them down in order, you end up with 360 months in a completely different order. Yes. And that will give you um, an idea of uh, a, one of the potential outcomes that you might have had. Um, uh, and it was probably just as likely as the one that did happen. Yeah. Um, uh, but... Um, uh, it um, if if you if you do that exercise multiple times, then you'll get a a spread of of possible returns that you might get or you might have had rather, uh, assuming the next thirty years have the same monthly returns as the last ones. Um, that that um, so it, it gives you a a measure of the spread of of how things might be different, might have been um, different, <laughs> or might have been different indeed. Yes, because the future is. Has no the, you know, markets and things like that have no memory. No. So no. the future could be completely different. Um, you know, if you'd done that exercise in 1917 in Russia, uh, looking at the previous 30 years, um, you might have been a bit surprised if you expected the next 30 years to look anything like that. Yeah. Um, because clearly they they didn't. No. And then there's my favourite, my favourite name, which yes. is uh, Monte Carlo, um, isn't it? Indeed. Um, so Monte Carlo simulation uh, gives a similar kind of range of outputs, um, and um, it's. It, I, I guess it's called. I think I believe it's called Monte Carlo because someone um, with time on their hands thought it was a bit like kind of multiple spins of the roulette wheel at Monte Carlo. Um, but intriguingly, um, it wasn't dreamed up by uh, an academic in the um, in the casino in. in uh, in, in the principality, uh, it actually arose from the Manhattan Project, which was the uh, the project, as um, as those with a, a penchant for history will uh, recall, was the project to design uh, the atomic bomb uh, in World War Two. And what the scientists who were building the, uh, the the bomb were trying to do was to find a way of simulating um, multiple um, possible. Um, series of events that could happen uh, when they were when they were looking at um, at the whole fission experiment, and um, so Monte Carlo is basically a way of taking uh, a number of variables, um, which would be uh, an average uh, or uh, um, an, an, an expected for in investment terms, it will be an expected return, so an, a, a mean uh, a mean return, uh, a standard deviation of that return. Uh, and if you're looking at uh, multiple um, uh, variables, as you tend to be with investment, um, then some kind of correlation coefficient. Uh, and um, and then you, um, you you then by applying these things to um, a, a piece of software, you can end up with uh, a, a kind of thing that looks like a um, uh, a, a distribution chart uh, 
um, uh, and um, and it will give you an idea of what returns you might expect based on that data. Yeah, a kind of range, isn't it? It's a range, yes, exactly. Um, and that's all jolly good um, because, once again, it shows you that there's a, a pretty wide range of possibilities that could happen. Um, uh, someone did this with the, um, to, you know, I mentioned the Bank of England's uh, efforts to keep um, interest rates at a certain level. Someone did it a while back with the, um, uh, to, to look at the Bank of England's efforts to control inflation uh, and, um, and how accurate their predictions for future inflation were. Uh, looking forward, not all that long, only, some, I think it was about something like three years. Uh, so not a terribly long period. Um, and bear in mind the smart people they have in the Bank of England. Um, it turned out that they were within about 90% of getting it accurate most of the time. Wow. Um, but they weren't terribly close to the target line that they were, that they were aiming at. Um, so even with something where it's fairly short term and where um, you're not dealing with lots and lots of variables, um, it doesn't necessarily give you that much more accuracy. No. Uh, and I, I often think of, of of these things when people sort of promote them to me as um, it's kind of like you you do your you do your financial plan projection and uh, at the end of it you can you can say to the or, or you, know, you 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 can look at the end position and say to the client well probably when you get to age ninety you'll be somewhere between living in a cardboard box and living in a mansion <laughs> but. I can't tell you which of those is more likely yeah. because um, they're all equally likely, according to this. Yeah. You'll probably be somewhere in the middle. Um, mm. And it may be that actually none of these paths turns out to be correct. Yes. Um, and and I'm, personally, while that's it's, it's valid for explaining how uncertain everything is, um, I don't think it's hugely helpful when the client next says, okay, so what should I do? Yes. And that's the thing. That's what they say. You know, they it say is. things like, well, you know, that's why I engage you. That's why I pay you to, to give me advice on what to do next for, that would, mm. you know, maximize my chances of getting the outcome that I want. Yes. Uh, and there's there are, there's always a lot of variables, but there's a, there's always also a, a limited number of levers that the client can pull, Yeah, um, which are typically limited to spend less, um, uh, save more. Uh, take more risk. That that covers most of them, really. Earn or, more. Yeah, a bit um, of everything. Yeah, exactly. Or 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 a bit of all of those. Um, uh, but you you know you don't want to be. I, I was. I, I I'm pretty pretty confident you don't want to be in a position of saying to a client, well, because you know the worst case is pretty grim. You probably need to get a second job, um, work weekends, um, spend nothing. And um, and put all your money in emerging markets um, warrant funds or something. Mm, cross your fingers. <laughs> uh, exactly. Um, They'll probably uh, say because bye. <laughs> they're, and and also stop paying our fees because you know that's just money that's going out and um, and and you know if if it's not going out then it's accumulating in your bank account rather than um, rather than keeping me uh, going. So it's not necessarily terribly practical. To, no. um, to do that, I would say. No. Okay, let's move on to one of another interesting topic and something that it takes, It's ta we've seen in the past being assessors, the pair of us, it's taken people quite a long time to kind of bend their heads around the impact of, and the differences between nominal rates of return and real rates of return. Because I think in the past we've said, well, it, you know, it, it's pretty simple, the explanation, um, but it's actually the impact of the difference between the two, I think, that really matters. So just give us a quick rundown of what is nominal returns and what are real rates of return? Uh, OK, well, I think it is pretty simple, actually. Um, uh, nominal returns are the, um, the, the return that you get in terms of cash. So if you put your money in the bank and you can find a bank that pays you 1% a year, and you put in um, uh, a pound at the end of the year, you'll get back a pound and a penny. Um, and that's the, you know, you can take that penny and you can wave it around and say, this is the interest I have earned and it is 1%. Um, uh, 
Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and that applies obviously to other things like, you know, this is my house and I, I, my house costs 100,000 pounds. It's gone up 1%. So at the end of the year, um, uh, it's, it's now worth um, 1,000, uh, sorry, it's now worth 101,000 pounds. No, it's worth 110,000 pounds. <laughs> I okay. always use a calculator. <laughs> and real um, rates of return? So real rates of return are uh, they, they 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 start with the with the nominal return, but they take account of what you can actually buy with it. So typically, you would then apply an adjustment for what the rate of price inflation is at the time. Um, so, if for example, you um, uh, you manage to get a return of 5% on your investments. So that's all jolly good. Um, and at the end of the year, you can uh, you can cash them in and you can wave the 5% around to, uh, that you've earned uh, and say, that's great. Uh, but inflation might have been 2%. Um, and therefore, uh, all of the things you might buy with your 5% have actually gone up in price. Yeah. Uh, and because they have gone up in price by 2%, uh, you now can't buy £105 worth of stuff um, that you might have bought last year. Um, you can only buy £103 worth of um, uh, 100, sorry, uh, sorry, the, the £100 of stuff that you could have bought a year ago and had £5 left over will now cost you 102 so you only have £3 left over. Yeah. But in some situations, because it's it, it's that buying power, isn't it, that is the most important. So when clients say you know, I want to retire on, you know, an income of, you know, £30,000 or whatever it might be, £40,000, um, retiring at 55. Um, they they mean buying power of 40000 don't they? Because it's what they could buy today to cover their expenditure. I, I think in almost all cases, that's exactly what they think. Um, and in fact, typically when people say they want an income of X, they don't really mean they want an income of X. What they mean is they want an expenditure of X. Yeah. Um, uh, because while people accept that it may be necessary to pay taxes, um, they don't necessarily um, see paying taxes as part of their objective. No. Um, so if they could have, if they say I want a, um, I want an income of thirty thousand, and they actually mean I want expenditure of thirty thousand, if they could have thirty thousand without paying any tax on it at all. Uh, they'd probably be quite happy with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yes, they they mean they want to spend that. Um, yeah. And um, and 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 it's it's very much more difficult for somebody to um, to predict what expenditure they're going to want to have in thirty years' time um, without using without refer without without comparing it to what they spend now. Uh, yes. And if they spend now, spend thirty thousand a year now, and they don't expect their lifestyle to change materially uh, over the next thirty years, then it's it's pretty straightforward to, for them to be able to say, "Well, I want an, I want the same lifestyle." So let's assume that's thirty thousand. Uh, you know, I can if if I can buy this many things for thirty thousand pounds today, I want to be able to buy the same things yes. in thirty years. Same buying power, and mm. and how does the how does that impact um, when we're doing projections for clients? That the, looking at the real rate of return, um, because it's one thing understanding, you know, that kind of one nominal is kind of including inflation. It just it is the face value. The, the the real rates of return is effectively the buying power, the kind of net of inflation along the way. Um, but then how does that actually shake out when we start looking at projections for you know, retirement? What does it do to the numbers actually in the spreadsheets that we might create for our financial plan assessment? Uh, well, if you, um, it, you, ha you have basically two ways you can do it. Um, uh, if you were building your own calculations, you can either do all of the calculations in nominal terms and then apply a discounting um, uh, to uh, to each uh, each value um, to allow for inflation, um, which uh, will will work as long as you do, as long as your maths is correct. Um, but you 
you kind of run the risk that with that that it apart from the fact that it's a load of extra work um, and extra work is that's unproductive is is kind of a bit pointless really um, with my business owner hat on. Um, it also adds risk because you're creating the risk of making errors, uh, and the more steps you have in your calculations, and the uh, um, then the the more difficult it is to spot those errors, and potentially you could be making them for a long time. Yeah. Um, uh, so I've always held the view that it's much easier to do your um, uh, apply your inflation adjustments uh, at the start, and then use uh, real rates of return and and, and, um, and and any other measure that you're using to discount it if, discount the rate before you start messing around doing the, the projections yeah and um, I think it- so you so, so that would and that would apply not just to investment return but it would apply to for example um, your um, if you're if you're planning a, to assume a rate of earnings inflation that's higher than prices, uh, or you're planning to, um, uh, you're, you're expecting to employ a rate of um, of expenditure escalation that's higher than general prices, then you you adjust everything by your your price inflation assumption. So you will see um, that the basically the line will be less steep for for all of those measures once you uh, once you adjust for inflation. Yeah. Um, so the the the, the um, instead, instead of Instead of going up at quite a steep angle, if you've got if you're assuming a, a return that's substantially above inflation, once you apply inflation, then something that's, that's um, that goes up exactly with inflation will be a level, will be a flat line across the across the chart, and everything else goes up by the amount according to the amount by which it exceeds inflation. And using real rates of return for a client in you know real client situations can be very beneficial isn't it because like your your 30,000 pounds a year expenditure requirement for when your your client retires you were just talking about a moment ago in a spreadsheet once you 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 know you get your you you do all your projections then actually what falls out the bottom the client can actually see that that is you know, ne- you know the buying power of thirty thousand pounds net of tax, net of charges, net of inflation um, at the time that they want it. So it kind of makes it it's a bit more user friendly for the client as well. I think, isn't it? Oh, undoubtedly, yes. Um, it, it is. It is much easier to to explain. Um, uh, I, th- I think you know the back in the um, in the in the distant past when um, when the mandated projections that the regulator required. Companies to produce were um, were all in nominal terms. You would see these telephone numbers um, come out at the end. Oh, whoopee do! Your pension will be worth you know eight hundred and fifty thousand pounds, or yeah. fund, fund will be worth eight hundred fifty thousand pounds. But that was forty years ahead, and it didn't really tell you anything about whether I was whether you were funding it as uh, um, to the extent that you needed to to meet your objectives, because what it didn't tell you was well by then your expenditure could be. Two hundred thousand pounds a year, yes. And your pension fund's only four times your yearly expenditure, so that might not be enough. Not going to last you very long in that situation. Um, and um, so it was. Uh, uh, I think it's you know it, it's undoubtedly a good thing in planning to um, to work in in real terms. Mm. Um, it makes it much easier for everybody involved, uh, and if you're consistent with it. Then um, you don't have to kind of remember each time you look at it. Oh, now is this real or nominal? Yes, because you know that they're always real. Yeah, and I think also if you use nominal rates of return, you've got quite an explanation for the client, haven't you? Because basically, you've got to say, well, actually, I know that you've said you you told me you want thirty thousand pounds of expenditure, you know, when you retire in however many decades it is. Um, but actually, thirty thousand pounds isn't that. It is whatever it might be, you know, fifty six thousand nine hundred and forty p yeah. thousand pounds and twenty p, and that and actually, so therefore, I'm actually targeting that, even though it feels to the client it would be easier for them to say. Say, well, I want thirty thousand, and then to be able to look if they wanted to into the tables and go, oh yes, there's my thirty thousand. Indeed, yes. Yeah, it's quite com- it can, yeah. can get it, and, that complicated conversation, isn't it? Oh yeah, and you know it's um, you know bear in mind that you with typically with 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 a, with a client you you may only see them for two or three hours a year at their annual review meeting, um, and so you want to make sure that you get or they get 
um, uh, the uh, the messages from that that you want them to get. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, and and ideally, you know, if they say they want a certain level of income or a certain level of expenditure to to be met, uh, and you can show them that that number being met, they will go away happy and comfortable. Um, uh, rather than if you show them that actually they need a lot more than that, um, but that looks okay as well. Um, yes. they, they, you can't control what they remember. No, um, no. And the danger is that they'll remember the wrong thing. Yeah. So finally, let's talk about, you know, we started to talk about what happens when you see real clients as opposed to doing the, you know, level seven case study assessment. Um Many people, many financial planners are starting to use um, cash flow software, maybe in a combination or instead of, um, you know, traditionally we might have used Excel spreadsheets in the past. Um, and just give us a rough rundown on what the situation is with assumptions in these proprietary software systems, whether they, if they're pre-populated and whether you can use the ones that are inside those systems or whether you should be setting your own. Well, the, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with, with all of the tools by any means, um, uh, but um, uh, we, uh, I know that I know my way around enough of the one that we use, um, and I've looked at a couple of others when we were considering what to buy to replace the spreadsheet-based tool that we used ourselves for some years. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, as far as I know, the the regulator has never kind of specified anything about what rates of return you have to use. Um, they do produce a handy, um, or they commission, um, I think PwC actually does the legwork for it, uh, they commission a, a handy um, a piece of research every few years on um, uh, on projection rates. Um, and uh, and you can find those on the, um, on the FCA's website. Uh, and that's that's quite useful. Not not you know I don't recommend it because it's something that the regulator produced and therefore you have to follow it. Um, but just that it um, it gives you some numbers and some methodology, um, and um, uh, and therefore it's a useful contribution to the to the thought on the subject. Um, but you um, there's there's no. Um, there's no obligation to use particular rates of return, and there's no obligation to use particular rates of inflation or any other assumptions. Um, uh, they, they are up to the um, they're up to the practitioner which ones they they select. Um, but from the perspective of um, uh, if you're um, a senior manager in a business um, uh, where you're you have a liability for the um, uh, the, the the work that is produced and um, and potentially um, you have a um, you may have to go and defend something in court um, uh, then I think it's uh, I would just feel a lot more comfortable uh, if I knew that um, everyone in the firm was using uh, the same set of assumptions uh, at least as a default um, not clearly you know they may be they may be varied by individual clients. Um, particularly for things like earnings expenditure, earnings inflation for that particular client, um, and expenditure inflation for that particular client. But uh, as a, as a starting point, I would I would be uh, much happier if I knew that everyone in the firm was using the same set of assumptions, uh, and that the, that set of assumptions had been agreed throughout the business as being a reasonable starting point. Um, yeah. Because I think. Um, you're creating a whole lot of risk if you let people do their own thing um, and uh, make up their own numbers as they go. Um, you also, you know, we we have a situation periodically, you know, where somebody goes on holiday, and one of the clients with which they deal, as, um, which they principally deal, um, needs to have a meeting. Um, uh, it is um, going to create a lot more work if you look through their plan before the meeting. Um, knowing that it's a client you're not familiar with uh, and you discover that um, the assumptions have been used in their plan are ones which you completely wouldn't use yourself. Um, mm. And then you're faced with going into a meeting and, ex and when they say, well, why did you use that? You have to explain something that you don't agree with. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a bit, um, bit, bit tricky. And I think it, the, the, that's um, the, exactly the same applies to you buy yourself a piece of software um, and 
in order to help the users, um, uh, it comes with a set of assumptions preloaded. Um, and those assumptions, someone or, or a, some group of people um, who may or may not work for the company that produced the, uh, the software, um, uh, that, that's a set of assumptions that they've come up with. And you may or may not be told what their thought process was. Um, and I have seen, uh, I have seen some where I found it, where I was sent a document to explain what the thought process was, and it was a thought process that I personally thought was um, a pretty unsound mm -hmm. um, because it, it it used I think where they couldn't get any long term data for a particular um, type of asset, they took the last ten years. Um, and said, um, well, we'll just assume that that's repeated for the next 10 and the next 10 and the next 10 and the next 10 years. Um, I, I would be nervous of using that assumption in a plan. Um, yeah. and, um, and I think you would certainly open yourselves up to a, a risk of, um, uh, of, of, of losing a case uh, if you had to go and defend that. Um, yeah. And imagine you had to defend it when you only just found out when the um, when the other side's counsel brought it up that that was the method they used. Yes. So yes. Uh, although the, the software that we use has a, has a set of default assumptions, we look at each one of them and uh, we, um, we accept or reject them according to whether they are coincident with the numbers that we've come up with using our, um, our methodology. Because I'd be happy to stand up and defend our method um, uh, and I'd be less happy to stand up and defend a method that I had no input to. No. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. I think we are, well, we've been rabbiting away for nearly an hour now, so I think we'd better stop there. <laughs> um, but Rob, thanks very much for your pills of wisdom and sharing some of your expertise on assumptions. I'm sure that many of the people going through their level seven case study assessment and actually those who have already done it and are CFP professionals themselves will have gained some real insights into um, perhaps going back and reviewing what they do in their businesses um, as regards to assumptions after our discussions today. So thanks very much for joining me. Well, at all, uh, thank you for the invitation. And I'm, I hope it was of use to, um, to somebody who was listening. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast quite interesting to listen to the different views and discussions with different people, isn't it? Join me next time when we'll be discussing all things Certified Financial Planner related and catching up with those new to the financial planning profession. Bye for now. Bye.